word of men. You also find words of angels. When angels visited men, they spoke. We also find the words of Satan when he visited men. He visited Peter. That Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. He visited Eve. Praise God. Satan visited Eve. So that's why we said that the Bible is, contains God's word. So the Bible is a doorway to the spiritual realm. And also a manual for our journey into divinity. I want you to understand that the Bible is your manual. The Bible is your roadmap to the journey into the fullness of Christ. It's a unique book. The Bible defines itself as a revelation of God for the purpose of bringing salvation to men and navigating men to the fullness of Christ. That is the Bible for you. Hallelujah. So, we talk about the authority of the Bible. We said that the Bible claim is inspiration. The Bible is self claim is inspiration. It confirms is divine authority. The Bible also affirms is self as a special revelation from God. It asserted itself as a word from God to man. So we see the scripture as a word of God to man. So since the Bible claim is authority, inspiration, and special revelation from God to man, then it must be free from error and falsehood. Or else... It would not have been inspired by God. So the supremacy of the Bible is affirmed in that it is God himself that is speaking. Such as thus says the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses. So the Bible as certain is inspiration and infallibility. That's why you could see Jesus say, For most, I surely I said unto you, if he call them God, to whom the word of God came to, the scripture cannot be broken. All scripture is given by the inspirations of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You also see in Hebrew, God, who has sundry time, in various ways, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophet, had in this last day spoken to us by the son himself. Hallelujah. So I want us to see the uniqueness of the Bible, why the Bible is unique. We must understand this because our Bible is our manual principal book. So the uniqueness of the Bible is that, number one, it contains prophecies and their fulfillment. It contains many prophecies. Some of them, it took thousands of years, like Genesis 3, 15, the seed of the woman. It was prophesied. And then we saw the seed being born. In Genesis, God spoke to Abraham that you will have a son. We saw the fulfillment. So the scripture contained thousands of prophecies that came to fulfill. Then the authority, infallibility, and inerrancy of the Bible. Sometimes we assume there are errors in scripture. There's no error in the Bible. The word of God is tried seven times and is perfect. <coughs> I 
another uniqueness of the Bible, his message, the message of the Bible is relevant from the beginning of creation till now. I've never seen a book like that. Okay, it provides answers to all the issues of life from the beginning of creation till now. I've never seen a time they say, let us go and amend the constitution of the Bible. But you see, men can make law after two, three years, four years, ten years, it will be amended. But the, laws of, the law of God remains right from creation to date. What an awesome thing. All the authors lived at different times. Someone like Moses lived 1,500 years before Jesus. So about 1,600 years, Apostle Paul wrote, as some of them wrote, Isaiah wrote about 700 and something years before Apostle Paul. And amazingly, all of them wrote the same thing. They are scriptures, they are right of bore, one witness. Hallelujah. So, uh, they live at different time, background, and different perfection, yet they maintain one central team. Hallelujah. We've said all of these things on last Saturday. I'm just saying them for repetition. Then, what is the purpose of the Bible? What exactly is the purpose of the Bible? Now, because uh, you can use scripture for so many things that you use the scripture for many things does not actually mean that those things are the reason of the Bible. Like I said last Saturday, I remember when we were in secondary school. Uh, I remember those days when someone steals something. I would take a Bible and, 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 and go to Song of Solomon and put key inside it and place our hand and just enchant something, return, return, oh, Shulamite and all of those things. So we, you see, a lot of, uh, even the road safe to put Bible these days. So many people use his Bible. Occultic men use his Bible. But what is exactly the reason for the Bible? Like I've said, you can use scripture to eat. Very easy. Use Bible to eat. Use Bible to build houses. All the cathedrals build. They use Bible. All the crowd gather, they use Bible. But what is the reason for the Bible? That's actually what we are looking at here. Amen. What is the reason for the Bible? Like we said that Bible is a divine manual from God to mankind for our day-to-day -day living. It's a divine manual from God to mankind for our day-to-day -day living. And perfection. Bible is given to us uh, so that we can live day to day life. So the purpose of the Bible is to bring men to perfection, the state of God, and thoroughly furnish man unto every good work. This is the reason for the Bible. The reason for the Bible is for our day to day living. To bring men to perfection, which is the state of God, and to furnish us unto every good work. We could see that in a Second Timothy chapter three, Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen. Second Timothy three. Second Timothy three sixteen. All scriptures is given by the inspirations of God. All scripture is given by the inspirations of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. So the scripture is for day-to-day -day living in righteousness. Day-to-day -day living in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, 
thoroughly equipped for every good work. Hallelujah. So the Bible has answers to all the issues of life. That's why we, we have to use it to live. It's also, the scripture also has answer to man's questions about God and his creation. There are so many th theories about God, existence of God, about creation. We have so many theories about, you know, creation, evolution, and uh, some myths about creation. But the scripture gave us the authentic answer about God and about creation. So it is important for us to know that the primary reason of the scripture is not just to eat food, is to live as God specified for us. The scripture is to tutor us in righteousness. The scripture is to guide us to perfection. These are the primary reasons of the Bible. Hallelujah. Now let's look at the 66 books of the Bible. Amen. The 66 book of the Bible. How did we come about the 66 book of the Bible? How did we actually come about 66 book of the Bible? How did we agree that the 66 book of the Bible, they are inspired by God? Why some uh, have over? Some have about uh, 70 books. I think they apocryphal. So how did we come about the 66 book? That's actually what we are going to look today at this course. Biblical survey and appreciation. Praise God. So we have established the fact that the Bible is an inspired book given uh, to man by God through the inspired authors and his errancy and infallibility are validated. Therefore, the 66 books we are ensured to be inspired by God. This 66 book we are inspired by God. You see, now, after the death, resurrection of Jesus, and the acts of the apostles, the church fathers found over 100, 100 write-ups, and all of these books uh, were claimed to be inspired. Now, in order to present a valid testimony of the scripture, the church fathers have to use standard measures by the help of the Holy Spirit to validate books that were inspired by God and separate them from those that their inspirations are questionable. They have to use some measures to validate the books that were inspired, and then the books that were not inspired. Amazingly, some of the books found were valuable and contain fundamental facts historically, but they were not authenticated nor approved to be inspired by God. Some of these books found so since the Bible is the major source of the doctrine of God, its inspiration must be validated. Since we say it is given by God, we must be sure that what we are receiving is actually what was given to us by God, not just by human intellect. Now because if man give it, it cannot uh, accomplish nor actualize what God intended for, uh, you know, the scripture to do. Praise God. So some of those books have so much fact and why saying, but their inspirations was 
questionable. Now, I have read some of them. They were rich and also provided valuable information. Some of those ones I read were nice. I mean, the ones I read out of the, you know, uh, setting the um, 66 books aside. Some of those ones I found, they have some wise sayings, nice information. But since they were not included in the inspired book, I personally kept some of those facts. For instance, I, 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 I personally pick interest in a particular book called <coughs> The Book of Jesha. The Book of Jesha. I read it. Um, one of the reasons why I read Jesha, because the book was referenced in the Bible. Praise God. Hallelujah. So the book of Jesha was referenced in the Bible, but yet because it was not inspired, it has some valuable information that fill in the that I felt that they fill in the gap where scripture was silent. But the reason why I cannot say that it is of God is because it was not validated to be inspired of God. Now, for instance, when you read the book of Joshua chapter 10, verse 13, he mentioned Jesha. You also read 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. It also mentioned Jesha. Joshua 10, 13 said, The sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jesha? For so the sun stood still in the midst of the heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. So this account that was found in the, in the Bible, in the book of Joshua, so the author of the book of Joshua must have read Jesha. So Jesha is an ancient book. Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 17, David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the songs of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jesha. Praise God. Now, I want to say one uh, amazing thing. As I was reading the book of Jesha, I was asking myself, why was Jesha not canonized. Now the word canonized simply means it was not authoritatively uh, proved to be inspired of God. It was not agreed that it was inspired. So that book was not canonized. Now I was asking myself why was Jesha not canonized? Because of the content therein, because of what it contained. Now, while I was reading uh, that book, Jesha, I realized I was not having the surge. That's a surge I do have when I am studying the Bible. Now, if you study scripture very well, there's this surge, there's this power surge that flow when reading the Bible. Even the word of the Lord, praise God, the word of the Lord is being accompanied with power any time we encounter it. Any time you encounter the word of God, you sense power. If you check in the book of Luke chapter 24, the two main disciples on the way to Emmaus attested that when Jesus was talking to them, their heart was burning. So there's this power surge that flows from God himself. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 24, 32, 33. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he broke bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were open 
and they knew him. And he vanished from their side. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And why he opened the scriptures, you see? And why he opened the scriptures. Even when Jesus opened the scriptures, power was flowing. Uh, somewhere the scriptures say when Jesus was uh, present to teach, the Jew knew that the power of God was there to heal. Praise God. So uh, my experience with some of those books, I didn't really sense that surge. But yet, they have some facts. They have both historical fact. So, um, the measure they use is what they call canonicity. Now, the word canon simply means measuring standard or measuring read. So, a read or a standard used to determine inspired book that made up the 66 book of the Bible we have today. So that's why they call them canonized book. They were measured with certain measured to ascertain that this book were inspired of God. So to ensure the credibility of the scriptures inspiration status, the church fathers has to carry out canonical tests. Now, I want us to see some of the Test carried out just to ensure that this book we are of God. Hallelujah. So there were measures that the early church fathers used to determine the books that were inspired of God. Number one measure they used. Number one, the prophetic nature of that book. Is there an element of prophecy and its fulfillment? That's the first test. Number two test, they used to determine the inspired book. Now, the authority of God on the book, the authority of God, like thus says the Lord, which you cannot find in some of those books like Maccabees and Co. Hallelujah. So the authority on that book. So is there validity that the word was spoken by the Lord himself? That's the second test. Is there a proof that this thing is said by God? Like you see in Genesis, and God said, Thus says the Lord, the Spirit of God was upon me. Number three, is there, a, is there a valid operation of the supernatural in that book? We have to check. Is there a the valid operation of the supernatural, the act of God in that book? Number three, sorry, number four, is the book in agreement with other approved inspired book? Is the book agreeing now, there were some of them that you could also see element of prophecy, but they were not agreeing in certain area with doctrines of the Bible. Like, for instance, you find in a Maccabees the doctrine of purgatory, which the scripture, the other inspired book, do not agree with. Praise God. So, number five is testimony of Jesus found in the book. Do we have a testimony of Jesus? Or do we have a revelation of where Jesus was revealed in that book? Now, because Jesus is a central theme of the Bible, which we are also going to see. Number six, in the case of the Old Testament, Scriptures did Yeshua reference or quoted from the book, just as we could see that Jesus quoted Jeremiah, Jesus quoted Isaiah, 
Jesus quoted Ezekiel. Jesus quoted, you know, Habakkuk. Jesus quoted Haggai. Jesus quoted Malachi. Jesus quoted Psalms. Jesus quoted Genesis, Exodus, and all of those things. But you see, we didn't see Jesus quote all of those, you know, Tobiad, Wisdom, Maccabees, Jesha, he didn't, you know, quote from them. Then number seven, the acceptance of the book as God's word by the people. It was primarily addressed to. The people the book was addressed to primarily, do they receive it as a word from the Lord to them? Hallelujah. Amen. Now, what I'm sharing with us is how we got the 66 book inspired by God. It's important that we understand it. Now, because of the scripture is where the doctrine of Christ, which is our tools to raise the sons of God to maturity. So we are not going to use um, doctrines, theories, principles that are not of God. Don't forget that, 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 that it was said to Israelite, don't plant another seed in your vineyard. So they were careful to ensure that another doctrine, you see, doctrine is important. That's why Paul urged Timothy and Titus that they should pay attention to doctrine. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. They are profitable for doctrine. Now the reason for all of this thing, now so that we won't bring in the idea of man as doctrine of God in the scripture. That's why the canonicity is very important, is very vital, is also a key. Amen. Praise God. So the authenticity of the Old Testament scriptures the authenticity of the Old Testament scriptures. Old Testament books as inspired book. Number one, how they were authenticated as inspired book. Number one, Yeshua acknowledged the Old Testament books as the scripture. Jesus acknowledged them. Number two, you know, Jesus, you know, uh, he said, at this is not written in the law, and the prophet, even in Psalms. Number two, Jesus quoted from them. We know that Jesus quoted from them. Jesus quoted uh, from almost all the books. Number three, the apostles of Jesus Quoted from them. We could see Peter quoted from that in Acts of the Apostle, chapter 2, even chapter 3. We could also see James quoted that in Acts of Apostle, chapter 15. He quoted from the prophecy of Amos, of the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David. So many of them, we saw Jude quoted from them. We saw John quoted from them. We saw all the apostles, all the writers of the gospel quoted from the, New Test from the Old Testament. Now, this is a proof that they were an inspired book. Hallelujah. Numbers, um, number four. They have the Messianic prophecies. They have the Messianic prophecies. Number five, Christ is a central theme of that book, of the London Prophet, of the 39 books uh, that made up the Old Testament. 
Praise God. Please, somebody may say, why am I teaching all of this thing? Now, because this is a school. You must be able to know the foundation. You must be able to know the history and how the Bible was given to you and how you will know that you shouldn't bring from anywhere else to form doctrine. You shouldn't go and bring from Maccabees, who even said that it's not too sure of the authenticity. So you, you, you don't do that. That's why some has gone there and picked doctrine of purgatory, which is not scriptural. These are the reasons why we must build on the doctrine of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Number six, they claim their authority from God. The Old Testament book, this book claimed their authority from God. Such as the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, I the Lord. Which you don't see in all of those books. And number seven, Josephus, a Jewish historian from the priestly lineage acknowledged was a great historian. He acknowledged the 66 book as inspired book. Hallelujah. Then the authenticity of the New Testament books as inspired books. Like I said, after the death of Jesus, hundreds of books were found. There are books of Barnabas, books of uh, Clement, books of this, books of that, book. so many of them, and so many of them had information. Some of them uh, talked about the life of Jesus as a child, talk about things that were, so many things. So they need to separate them to know the ones that we are inspired of God. Hallelujah. Number one, yastic, measure of determine, they used to determine the 27 books, number one, is Jesus, the, the central theme of that book. So you find out that Yeshua is a central theme of the 27 books of the New Testament. Number two, the apostles claim their authority from God, like Paul. What I'm writing was not given to me by man. I received them from God by revelation. I received them from God by revelation. <laughs> Number three, the book contained fulfilled prophecies found in the Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament books contain prophecies. For instance, we saw the Passover. We saw the fulfillment of the feast of the Passover in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We saw the, the prophecy of the birth of Jesus. We also saw in Acts of the Apostles. We saw the fulfillment of Pentecost. We saw the fulfillment of so many things in there. The same thing we saw in the epistles there. Number five, sorry, number, number four, the doctrines of these books are consistent with the doctrines of the Old Testament. So we also find out that the doctrine found in, the, in these 27 books, they were consistent with what was found in the Old Testament. So by this, we acknowledge that they are saying the same thing. Therefore, they were inspired of God. Hallelujah. There, were, there was even one that gave a testimony how Jesus was uh, befriending, you know, this Mary Magdalene, which is out of the scripture, which is out of the doctrine of God which is not elevating Christ. So they have to determine that this is from God. Otherwise, 
if all of those books were added, there would have been confusion. I want to appreciate the work that the church fathers did. It was a great work to ensure they labored. In fact, they are the ones who labored to bet what we call Apostles' Creed to show us this is what the saint, the apostles, believe. Can I have as um, can I have Luke chapter one? Luke chapter one from maybe verse one. Let me find where it is. Amen. For as much as Luke one one, for as much as for as much as many taken have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which we are most surely believed among us. So Luke was talking about the things that was believed among them, even as they, the apostles delivered them unto us. These apostles now, we call them the apostolic fathers. So there is a, a difference between the apostolic fathers and the church fathers. So the apostolic fathers are the 12 apostles of Jesus who receive the doctrines and the teachings of Jesus Christ, transmitted them, and passed it to the church fathers. So that teaching, that doctrine, is actually the Messianic seed. It's actually Messianic life. That's why when Jesus prayed for them, he also prayed for them that will believe on him through them. So these apostles, he said, even as they deliver unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world. They were eyewitnesses. So the apostles, they, their disciples, the disciples of those apostles, like uh, Eranos, you know, Polycarp, some of them, most of them, some of them were disciples of John. So some of them, they began to, you know, set forth what the apostles believed. So it's important for us to know the doctrines, teachings that Jesus handed to the apostles. So what we are having today in churches, um, what, what are they? Coconut service, padlock key service, this Koboko service, all of these things, they are not doctrines of Christ. They are not doctrines of Christ. So the church fathers labored to preserve the doctrines of Christ and ensure that books that were not inspired of God gain entrance to the scripture. We appreciate them and the work they did for us, for the furtherance of the gospel of the kingdom. Amen. So, like I said, number four, the doctrine of these books are consistent with the doctrine of the Old Testament. Number five, um, the authors reference the Old Testament. They reference the Old Testament books. Just like, like I said earlier, Peter quoted Isaiah. James quoted Amos. They quoted, this is in accordance to what the prophet said. Hallelujah. Number six, the council of Athenaeus in AD 367. Another council of the church fathers recognized the 27 books or as inspired by God. Hallelujah. Then number seven, which is the last, the accuracy of history, uh, which is historical accuracy. The history, they are, they are in accordance, they are accurate 
why some of those books we are rejected is that they are, there are so much historical inaccuracy in them. As a result, they cannot be inspired by God. Now, if it is of God, are they, are there, there must be historical accuracy. Amen. Praise God. I think I will stop here for the day. Um, when we come again, we will also continue from where we stop. It's very fantastic that we know the nature of the scripture, how they came to us, their central theme, what the scripture is to do in us, the purpose of the scripture, so that we can use the Bible to promote other things more than what it is meant for. The primary reason of the Bible is to guide us to live godly, righteously in this world and to bring us to the stature of the fullness of Christ and equip us for every good work. It's profitable for doctrine that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. This is the purpose of the Bible. I want us to appreciate the church fathers, how they help us to secure these books and ensure that the church today, they uphold the real scripture that is inspired of the Lord. May the Lord bless us and grant us entrance into his everlasting kingdom in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Like I said, if you have any questions, um, any comment, anything you do not understand, please drop the question in our platform. Then they will be addressed. If there's anything that you don't understand, if there's a, a question you would like to ask, please do. And the Lord will help us to provide answers to them. May the Lord bless you, give you peace, give you entrance into his everlasting kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Francis Isibo. Uh, thank you, Brother Jude from Enugu. Good to have you here. Uh, thank you, Pastor Silvanos, Pastor Victor, Pastor Chris from UK. God bless every one of you in the name of Jesus. See you on Saturday this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.